when the saints come dragging in. <laughs> but they're coming in. That's good. That's good. Does anybody know what book we're in? Song of Solomon. Are you reading it? All of you reading it, I guess. Read it. Get familiar with it. We left off last week in verse 4 of chapter 2, but I want to back up just a little and catch us up because I quit in the middle of a middle of the story, the lesson. Verse uh, 15 of chapter 1, it says, My beloved is unto me as a cluster, or as 14, behold, verse 15, Behold, thou art fair, my love, behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. To the shepherd her eyes were an expression of, of her beauty. Her eyes were true eyes, not looking at Solomon and all of his glory and his eminence and his wealth and his prestige. Her eyes was only on her beloved. Her eyes were tender eyes. He referred to them as dove's eyes. Her eyes were trusting eyes, looking for the shepherd to deliver her in the time of temptation and trial. We need those tender eyes and those true eyes of loyalty and the trusting eyes of looking for our Savior to appear. He's soon coming. And then from her eyes, we see love's boldness. We talked about that. And love's bounty. And love's banner. Look in verse 5 of chapter 2. And note love's, love's bond. Stay me with Flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head. His right hand doth embrace me. She's overwhelmed and completely overcome by the shepherd's manifestation of love. Her request is for him to, to stay, to strengthen to sustain her. Phlegons is a reference to a raisin cake. It was thought together with the scent of apples. It said uh, in, in that verse, comfort me with apples. And so the phlegons was thought that with the scent of apples scattered all around to encourage and to sustain love. She declares she is sick through love. She's been reduced to a state of physical weakness by her longings and her desire. And this is the reason that she requires strengthening. You notice in verse 6, his left hand is under my head. His right hand doth embrace me. Here the beloved draws near to her in an intimate way. He's holding her close to himself. She is completely his, and he is altogether hers. His left hand holds her head up, gives her strength, and the right hand of his power is enfolding and caressing her. Here we see a beautiful picture of intimate fellowship enjoyed 
by the believer with our heavenly shepherd, our heavenly bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist said, he is the lifter up of my head, speaking of our Lord. And he is the one whose arms are underneath us and around us in his loving protection. He is ever present, always near, loving, caring, protecting for his children. Never lose thought of that, and you'll never be discouraged as long as you keep that thought foremost in your mind. Notice verse 7, and we see love's boundary. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rows and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up, nor awake my love, till he please. It seems that the Shulamus beloved has left her, and the court women have come back with the deliberate intent of trying to arouse the Shulamite's passion so that Solomon will find her an easy mark. You see the women of the court who were Solomon's women kept interfering, trying to get her more interested in Solomon and less interested in her shepherd lover. Look at the word awake, verse 7. The Hebrew word awake means in sight, in sight. So she's saying that her passions are not to be excited, awakened, or stirred up. She had clearly drawn love, love's boundaries in her life, and she refused to have anything to do with that which would stimulate passion and desire. Her love was reserved for her shepherd, and that love was clean, and that love was pure. The painted beauties of Solomon's court knew nothing of restraint. They knew nothing of modesty. They knew nothing of decency. You see, love does not trespass where law forbids. It's lust that does that. Love knows where to draw the line, where to recognize the boundaries between right and wrong. Lust blunders into sin, but love observes God's laws. You see, love knows how to wait and how to keep itself pure, observing love's boundary. You know, James refers to those who flirt and favor with the world as adulterers and adulteresses. And he says that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. And then he says, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you truly love the Lord Jesus Christ, our heavenly shepherd, our heavenly bridegroom, if we truly love him, we'll establish some boundaries in our lives. There'll be some things that others may be doing that we will say no to. That's out of bounds. I'm a child of God. I don't do that. I don't go there. I'm in love with my heavenly shepherd. Amen. Look at verse 8, down through verse 14 of chapter 2 now. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leapeth upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, 
Rise up, my love, my fear one, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Our turtle dove, literally, the fig, the fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines hath with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. When Jesus went back to heaven, he said to his disciples, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the angels reiterated the promise of his coming when they said to the men of Galilee, this same Jesus is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. These verses in Song of Solomon present us with a picture of conversion as the Lord comes to us and reveals his grace to our hearts and lives and then leaves us in this world of sin and sorrow. But our one hope, even though he leaves us in this world of sin and sorrow, he is our blessed hope, and he is the one hope that we have of his soon return. The one thing to always remember, if you are a genuine born again believer you are in this world but you're not of this world we belong to another world Paul says my citizenship is in heaven I'm just a pilgrim and a stranger in this world that's why we seem to be odd and peculiar to those around us why do you go to church so much Boy, you must be a bad person. That's the way the, the attitude of the world is about people that have regular church attendance, that we're trying to find favor with God somehow. No, we're here to honor him and to worship him, to lift him up. Let the lost and the dying world see what a wonderful heavenly bridegroom that we have. And we're in love with him and not with this world. <clears throat> These verses that I just read, we see the love of the shepherd. Verses 8 and 9, he talks about the shepherd's coming. The voice of my beloved, he cometh leaping up on the mountains, skipping up on the hills. My beloved is like a roe, or a young heart, a deer. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Try to visualize that scene. She discerns his voice. She knows his voice. His voice brought all the music of heaven into her heart. It was the first thing that arrested her attention. She would know that voice over all other voices. You remember Adam and Eve heard the voice of God in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. But there are many voices in the world seeking our attention and our devotion. But the voice of our beloved 
has a distinctive sound. When Adam heard the voice of God in the garden, it related to his sin of disobedience. Why did you hide, Adam? Because I was afraid. But why did you hide, Adam? Because I was naked. God killed an innocent, innocent animal, took the skins and clothed Adam, which is a type of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And every born again believer had been forgiven of sin, had received God's forgiveness, and we're clothed in his righteousness. We have none of our own, but we are clothed in his righteousness. Samuel heard the voice of God in the temple, and it had to do with service. And everyone will hear the voice of God from the grave. You're going to hear the shout one day. The Lord himself should have sent from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The word shout there is a military term. It literally means fall in. We're moving out. When you hear that shout, we're going to be gone to be with our Lord. Look again in verse 8 and 9 and note how she denotes his vigor. He leaps over mountains. He skips over hills. He overcomes every obstacle with, with ease. He's coming to rescue, to restore, and to revive, but especially to reveal himself, and nothing can stand in his way. He's going to receive his beloved. John Phillips said it this way. The Lord Jesus laid aside his glory, the glory that he had with the Father before the world began, and he stooped to be born into the human family by way of the virgin's womb. He entered his ministry in the face of ridicule, opposition, and unbelief to face Gethsemane, Gabbatha, Golgotha, and the grave. He was spat upon, beaten, scourged, crowned with thorns, and nailed to a cross. He died beneath the wrath and curse of God. He laid in, a de in death for three days and three nights while the entire universe held its breath. But he came bursting forth from the tomb. We ask ourselves, why should he come thus in all the enormous energy of his deity to pay such a price for us? There's only one answer. He loved us. He loved us. And then notice how she describes his visit in verse 9. He stands behind the wall. He standeth behind the wall. A wall is an obstacle, a barrier, and it's where the shepherd is. You, <clears throat> the other side of the wall. She refers to the wall as our wall. You see, we cannot see him with our natural eyes. We cannot touch him with our hands because of the wall of our human nature. We feel his presence. He is just a wall away and so very near. One day the wall will be removed and we shall see him as he is, and we shall know him as he is. Amen. He stands, but he also sees. He looketh forth as the windows, she said. Walls and windows are barriers to full fellowship. What a comfort it is to our hearts that he sees, he knows, he understands, and he cares. 
There are times in our disappointments, our sorrows, our discouragements, we cannot see him. But I assure you, he sees you. He never takes his eyes <coughs> off you. He loves you so much. He cannot help but keep his eyes upon you. And he knows. He knows how you hurt. He knows how you feel. He knows what you're going through. He knows better than anyone. And because he cares, he sees and he knows, he understands, and he cares. Thank God we have a heavenly bridegroom that cares about our hurts, our sadness, our sorrows. But not only does he stand, he sees, he shows. Notice it says, showing himself through the lattice. The word lattice, the, the rabbis speak of the word as meaning blossoms, denoting something that was protruding and the shepherd peering through the blossoms. At times he was so near that she could see the gleam in his eyes. There are times when, our, when the believer is so close to our shepherd that we see him. We see him in the scriptures. The Bible says in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of me. You want to see him? You'll find him on just about every page in the word of God. He's there somewhere peering through the lattice. We see him through the sorrows, uh, through all of our trying times, standing somewhere in the shadows. You'll find Jesus. Look around. He's still there. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Amen. Then verses 10 through 14 I know the shepherd's call. <clears throat> the call of the shepherd to the Shulamite girl was a threefold message that appeared that appealed to her her will, her mind, and her heart. Now, let me add this. Every message that God sends to us comes in the same way. It appeals to our will our mind, and our heart. His call symbolizes the call of the Lord Jesus to the human heart. First of all, the shepherd's call was volitional. In other words, his call appealed to the will. To each one of us is given a measure of volition and power of choice within certain bounds. Now we know that God works out all things in conformity to his own perfect will. But within the limits he has set for us, we do have power to choose. So he appeals to her volition. Statements such as, whosoever will may come, wilt thou be made whole? Choose you this day whom you will serve means that we have a measure of the power of choice. So when the shepherd says, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, it was a call to leave the old way of life and to have a new Lord. Leave the things that are behind, behind. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. But not only was the shepherd's call volitional, it was also logical. He not only appealed to his will, but to his mind. Verses 11 through 13, he says, 
For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come. And the voice of the turtle or turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs. And the vines with the tender grape give us a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. His call was logical, appealing to the mind. So he sets before her life that embraces, embraces all dimensions of time, past, present, and future. Notice the verse 11 again. The winter is past, the rain is over and gone. You see, the storms of life are ended. A new season is about to begin. Summer suns are on the way. The Lord Jesus has dealt with our past. He died for our sins, taking upon himself our indebtedness and paying our sin debt in full. In full. I made a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. But he paid it in full. God holds nothing against me now. I've been forgiven because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those cold, wintry experiences of life, which you always had to face alone, we can now face with him. We can look forward to eternal sunshine in a land of fadeless day beyond the reach of wind and storm. But not only do we, the Lord hath dealt with our past, notice the, we see his call also relates to the present. Verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. <clears throat> Our beloved shepherd wants to fill our lives with beauty instead of the bleakness and barrenness of life's cold, stormy winter. He wants to fill our lives with bliss instead of sorrow and sadness. The time of singing is come. He wants to give us a life of blessing, and the turtle dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Paul, in writing about the Holy Spirit, says, be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And the results of a Spirit-filled life, he says, is speaking to yourselves in psalms. Psalms, you know, were the original church songs, worship songs, and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That word melody means to strum an instrument. Just make melody in your heart to the Lord. As a believer, don't ever... Don't ever use this cop-out. Well, I can't sing a lick. Oh, yes, you can. If you know the Lord Jesus, he'll sing through you when the Spirit of God is in control of you. Be filled with the Spirit. By the way, you're not singing for the benefit of an, a congregation. You're singing unto the Lord. Once it ever occurs to you that he's the one we should be singing to, the congregation will be affected by it much more than what it is. He's our audience, and we're to please him in whatsoever we do. And then he talks about giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks always for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
marks of a spirit-filled life. And then we see in verse 13 how the, super, how the shepherd's call embraces the future. It's gone from the past to the present to the future. The fig tree put forth her green figs. The vines with her tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. You know that the fig tree is associated with the end of the church age, a symbol of Israel. Shortly before going to Calvary, Jesus cursed the fig tree because of its deceptiveness. It was the only judgment miracle Jesus ever performed and depicted the drying up of the nation of Israel. You can read it about it in Mark chapter 11. And then in his Olivet Discourse, standing on the Mount of Olives, Jesus announced that the fig tree would revive at the end of the age. And the fig tree is a reference to Israel. Jewish national life would flourish again on earth. There'd be the rebirth of Israel in the last days, would herald the end times, the end of the church age, and the coming again of Christ to reign. So from the standpoint of the shepherd, the prospect was glorious. People often ask me, I said, things are really looking bad, aren't they? I said, not from my perspective. They're looking good. Everything we're experiencing right now that's, that we're having a difficult time understanding is a fulfillment of prophecy. We're seeing it before our very eyes. What's going on in D.C. and the laws that are being, being spread across our land is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We're seeing it the world over in Great Britain, in Russia, Ukraine, India, it's all affected by it. And we've been told about it. It shouldn't discourage us. It ought to excite us because it tells us his coming is so much nearer than what we want to believe. The Shulamite should be ready. The child of God should be ready. The church should be ready for instant departure. She's about to leave. The Shulamite girl is about to leave her restrictive surroundings. The church, the glorious bride of Christ, is about to be delivered from its present restrictive surroundings the shepherd is coming to snatch us away Israel is back in the land enjoying a dynamic national life I do not believe that the re-election of Netanyahu is my accident. I believe it's a part of God's prophetic plan that he put back in his place where he is now because Israel is enjoying a dynamic national life. And so we as believers, as a church, as the children of God, should be ready for instant departure. It wouldn't bother me. I wouldn't miss this old scooter. I'd even leave it to an unbeliever if he wanted. I'm ready to go. Amen. And that old ceiling ain't going to hold me. <laughs> I'll go right on through it. <clears throat> but then so we've seen that the shepherd's call was volitional appealing to the will. It was also, <clears throat> well, I got it back up. Forgot what I said. My age, I'm allowed to do that, I think. Amen. Amen. 
It was logical. It appeals to the mind. But then notice also, in verse 14, the shepherd's call was emotional. It appealed to the heart. Oh, my love, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. The shepherd longs for a response from the one to whom he has given his heart. Ladies and gentlemen, love, by its very nature, is willing to give and give. But to reach its highest bliss, love must be returned. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, the ultimate gift. Our wonderful Savior comes to us with an appeal to the heart. He pleads for a response from us. He longs to hear our voice. Why do we keep him waiting so long when he wants to hear the pleas of our heart, the cries of our soul? He knows the burdens that we carry. Why do we hold on to them? Cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He can carry what you cannot. All you that live weary and are heavy laden, come unto me and find rest for your souls. We have a heavenly bridegroom that longs to hear from us. Look at verse 15 down through 17. Lord willing, we'll start here next Sunday. Too much to get into, too little time to cover it right now. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies until the day break and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe of a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. We're going to start there on next Lord's Day. Read the Song of Solomon. Read your four verses a day to keep up your daily Bible reading. Pray every day. Tell somebody about Jesus every day. Pick up some gospel tracts and leave them somewhere. Grocery store, restaurants, schools. Just drop them anywhere. You'll be amazed who will pick the one up and read it. So many things to do before he comes. But the Bible says we're to occupy till he comes. Just keep on going. Thank you for being in the class. I hope it's a blessing to you. I preach each week about it. I ask God to use it to be an encouragement. Not only encourage you, but be a means of spiritual growth in your lives as well. So you're going to be dismissed a little early, give you a little more time for walking around and fellowship. And Ralph, you can come back over now and talk to Junior. <laughs> you waited till we got started a while ago before you came, so I'm giving you enough time now.